Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Keeping Your Library Relevant, Viable, Transformative, and Essential in Your School. Hello, my name is Anthony Luskery, and I'm a Technology Integration Specialist here at Spark. Spark is an ITC. We serve about 30 districts in Northeast Ohio. Along with my uh, partner, Eric, who will be manning the shared document today, which I'll talk about in a few moments. We provide uh, support for about 30 districts in Stark and Portage County. But this webinar is for anyone, anywhere who has an interest in educational technology. So no matter where you're at, uh, this is available for you also. All of today's resources will be found at a shortened link, shortened URL, tiny.cc slash Spark, S P A R C C 236. Again, tiny.cc slash Spark 236. And there you'll find some, um, some items. When you get to that page, um, you will find our resources. But at the top, you'll notice there's a margin, you, um, a menu that you can jump to. And first, I'm just going to go to the home menu here and show you what else we have available. Uh, you'll notice that we have links to both upcoming webinars and to our recorded trainings. So here's uh, the tiny.cc236. you notice that we have the uh, video stream, which is there, and it'll be updated and live after the recording. We also have a number of session resources, including this slideshow that I was in right now, that I've just been in plus some other um, resources you might find useful for today's webinar. Again, as I said, there's a live session chat. We do it via a shared Google document. Everyone has edited rights to that. Eric Kurtz is manning, manning that for me today. Next item, we have a session evaluation. Please fill out the session evaluation if you wouldn't mind to give us some input on our sessions. Also, if you have a suggestion you'd like to suggest to us, that's one way you can do that. And finally, uh, we have a prize for you. If you uh, watch it, go through the webinar, watch the video, you can take a quiz at the end. And by clicking that little link, it'll bring up a Google form. It'll be a short quiz. If you get an 80% or greater, uh, you will be emailed a certificate of completion for one hour of professional development through the Stark County ESC. And then you can present that to whoever might be responsible for professional development in your district. Now, uh, I presented this at a conference, and also when I'm presenting it online, I really don't care for the underscoring on uh, links. So you notice that the web links throughout this presentation do not have underscores. They're not blue. Most of them are this sort of uh, maroon color, and they I try to put them in a different font to make them easy to tell. I use a serif font, droid serif. So you'll see that throughout this document, there'll be a number of links. Also, most of the images in this presentation are also links. So if you're not sure if it's a link, try clicking on it and see if you get another page. So today, our goal is multifold. We want to talk about a lot of different areas that we can do to help make your uh, school library more relevant, more uh, vibrant, more interesting to the rest of the school district. And the first thing I want to talk about is something uh, called value-added reseller. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this term, but a value-added reseller is someone who adds features or services to an already existing product. They may redistribute it then as an integrated turnkey system. They might provide training. They might provide other resources. So you're not just buying the product. You're buying the backing and the value added for the product. The reason why I bring that up is I'd like our goal today for you to become a VAL. And VAL stands for...
Okay, sorry for the little gap there. We'll trim this out. Um, Google Hangouts decided it wanted me to put in a password again. I'm not sure why, but uh, hopefully it will cooperate with us through the rest of today. So I'm going to uh, bring up our slideshow here again, and we'll continue talking about value-added librarians. So our ultimate goal today is to become a value-added librarian, and along with that, a value-added library. So we're going to start with a game plan. The first thing we're going to start with is the current resources that you're probably responsible for, your physical book, physical library book collection, periodicals, you might have some other resources, maybe you have rock collections. I know some places have science materials in, in their library, so you have physical items that are part of your collection. You might also have online subscriptions. In Ohio, we have something called Info Ohio, and it's a group of databases, online tools, a wide variety of very rich materials um, that are available. Your, your state may have something different, Many libraries also purchase other services. So you may have some, have some other services that you purchase. So part of your current value, before we go through this value added process, is you manage the physical collection. You probably advise people on what books might be something they might be interested in, might fit the lesson they're teaching, might fit um, their individual needs. So you help people in picking out items from your collection. You're probably also responsible for selecting items to add or to remove from your library. So uh, that's another one of the things you do. And you're probably also giving some advice on reading literature, in literacy, I'm sorry. Uh, not necessarily teaching reading, but giving some advice on that, you know, finding Lexile appropriate books, uh, maybe doing some other projects to encourage literacy within your school district. And I'm sure you're probably also involved in purchasing, uh, usage of purchased services. So let's go through our game plan, and now let's start adding additional value to that. So the first one I want to talk about is technology skills. Quite often, I know many librarians are asked to take part in this process. In some cases, they are the only one involved in teaching technology, especially in elementary school. So one of the things you can do is help provide technology skills, both during inst specific instructional times, but also when you're working with library facts, when you're showing people how to use the card catalog or do other things in the library uh, technology-wise. Also, you may be incorporating some of these technology skills and training into providing next generation assessment help for the students. So when they're ready to take these tests, they'll be comfortable with moving the mouse, slot, dragging, and dropping, and other items such as that. And again, if you're the only person doing this or the main person responsible, you may want to see my link here to a technology scope and sequence for K through 12, just to give you an idea of some of the things that you may want to be covering or your district may want to be covering. So here's a link to the scope and sequence, just a little screenshot here of what, it, what the scope and sequence looks like. And uh, of course, this, the scope is the things you're doing and the sequencing is what grades is done in. And again, that would be adjusted for your school. Our second item under added value is research, uh, also known as searching. I like to call it research, though, because you can't just do it the first time around. You have to research to actually find the things you're really looking for. And I am going to ask you to just do something here you may be comfortable with, you may not be comfortable with. Uh, many librarians are very comfortable with showing students how to search through the online databases that they may have through Info Ohio or other services. And I call those the civilized databases because they are curated databases. And uh, searching through those is a little different than searching on the wild, wild web uh, or, the, uh, or the rest of the, the world. Now, one of the reasons why it's important in to include this in your searching training is when your students leave your district, uh, they will not have always access to cur nice curated databases. And I have a link here for uh, a whole section on searching. And searching is one of my favorite topics. And so I have a lot of things here on this page. And I'm just going to jump over to this for a second and show you what it looks like live. And again, this is um, the website I'll be going back to over and over again, it's, um, my partner was nice enough to name it the Web Resources Hoarder Site. And you'll see why in a few moments. 
Um, one of the items on here, though, you'll see a tab on the top for searching, and then there's also a link down here with the bright yellow button. When we click on that link, we will see uh, my searching resources page. Across the top, there's some quick links to some search sites that are general use. Uh, in most cases, though, I direct them to the advanced page, and that's a whole other session. You may want to go back and watch webinars searching 101, searching webinars on searching number two, and then a third webinar on a variety of different search engines getting out of that single search engine rut. So this page provides you with um, some resources on how to search, some examples on uh, different searching skills, syntaxes, etc. On the right you'll see some nice uh, diagrams that are very hard to see on this size screen, but they're designed to be printed 11 by 17 and give you something I call recursive web searching. It's a step-by-step -step systematic approach to searching. And then below that we have a list, a listing of over 200, uh, well right now are 247 searching sites and they're categorized by different um, types of sites. So again, that's searching. I don't want to go off on that too much, but again, probably something you're very involved with adding value in your library through searching. The next item is information and media literacy. Um, unfortunately, the United States is one of the few modern countries that does not have media literacy integrated into the curriculum at all levels. And, but yet our students are bombarded daily with a wide variety of media. And also, it also ties back into searching. When you find things searching, you need to be able to evaluate the quality of those materials. And part of that is media literacy. But media literacy also can be applied to a wide variety of other things. And these fall into the rest of the curriculum uh, through every grade. So I have a page that's a link to a wide variety of media literacy resources. And I'm not going to go to the page right now. This is just a screenshot, but again, you can. We'll, we we'll have the link to this. If you click on this link, it'll take you directly to that page. I just want to point out two items on here real quick because I think they're, they're very, very helpful. This MLC looks sort of a little boring and uh, might not be the, the flashiest icon on the screen, but it's probably one of the best resources. F.W. Baker has a lot of material on media literacy. And as librarians, I'm guessing that you're probably seeing some other sites on here that you're familiar with that can help uh, teach your students, and also that you can provide to your teachers to help them with media literacy in the classroom. Our fourth item under adding value is the ability of curation of online resources to both meet student needs and busy teacher needs. What does that mean? That means basically finding websites and finding materials on the web that you can provide to teachers that they can use in their lessons. And you probably are one of the best searchers and, and probably one of the best people in your entire school at finding resources. So that's a great area to add value for all of your school. Um, the next one is semi-curated collections and or original materials. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along. So here's our game plan. Here's all the different things we can be doing to add to our value added resources and make you a value added librarian. If we don't do those things, we're always in danger of something I really dread to hear, and I'm sure you do also, when someone just says, well, it's just a library. Uh, you know, just go down there and take a look at the books, and oh, do we really even need books because we have computers now? Well, you need to make sure that they realize that as a librarian and as a library, you're providing this whole range of services, not just books and periodicals. So again, we want to make everyone be excited about the library, not just give it the same. It's, it's just a library. And uh, unfortunately, I left out the extra close, close, close quotes there. So I'll fix that in the slide later on. So let's talk now about some of these resources I mentioned earlier that you might want to do as far as creating value for your library. So the first thing are educational resource sites. These are websites that might have um, resources for um, research. They might have online simulations. Online simulations are a way of providing an experience for students that they might physically typically do, but 
this provides a way to do it. So instead of just talking about the five simple machines, they could go to an online simulation site such as EdHeads, and they could actually manipulate all the machines in EdHeads garage, use the screw, the lever, etc. And these type of online simulations can be very helpful in instruction. Uh, they, they are also very good for students who have different modes of learning because they are actually manipulating things. And they are also a good precursor to any of the high stakes learning that your students may be involved in because a lot of times they need to manipulate things in that type of situation. Also, web apps are another area. So there's a whole wide variety of web resources available. And let's talk now about curation. Um, the first group we're going to refer to is the curated commercial content. These are the things that are curated for you. So you've paid money or someone's paid money for your students and your teachers to be able to have access to these commercial materials. Info Ohio is a good example, a whole, whole collection of resources. Your district may directly purchase surface, services or collections um, available through a wide variety of locations. Also, in some cases, your textbooks, if you're still using textbooks, uh, may come with related resources that you might be involved in making sure that all the students have access to. to. And if you went with electronic textbooks, that may be also another way in which you're working with commercial curated content. Next area is curated non-commercial content. The good thing here is non-commercial usually means free or very low cost. Where do you find things for free or very low cost? Well, there's a wide variety of government and nonprofit and public organizations that provide resources online. There's also some foundations that provide information online and resources. So there's also some free resources or free versions from commercial providers. So some commercial providers say, you know, if you want all of our services, you can pay for them. But if you just want a little bit of them, we're, we're willing to give you those for free. So these are curated non-commercial content. And we'll talk more about where you might find some of those later on here. Our third type of curation is semi-curated collections. And this is the way I'd refer to the web pages I've shown you already and some of the web pages I'm going to show you later. They are basically items that you personally or someone you know, such as you're welcome to use my curated materials, goes through, and I call it semi-curation because we don't go through every single page. We look at the general website and we review some pages to make sure there's something that we want to share with our teachers and students and other educators, but we don't go through page by page, check each fact one by one. So they are not fully curated, but I call them semi-curated sites. And again, um, that's not like the semi-boneless ham. When you talk, start talking about curating or curing, you might be thinking of ham. So again, semi-curated collections are something that you or someone that you might know puts together for you. So my web resource hoarder site is a good example. You may also already have a library website that you've created. Um, another area that's great for semi-curated collections is there's a whole wide variety of people out there blogging or creating sites who are very much educational leaders in their specific areas. And what you can do, if nothing else, is provide links to these types of resources so that people can be reading a daily blog or subscribe to a daily blog. Uh, my partner, Eric Kurtz, has a wonderful one called um, Control-Alt-Achieve. And if you've not heard of that yet, you might want to take a look at Control-Alt-Achieve. But that's just an example of some of the semi-curated resources out there. So let's take a look at some of them. If you go to our main technology integration page, which is ti.apps.spark.org, and I'll just pop over there real quick and actually show it to you in the real live version, you'll notice that there are a wide variety of links here. The first one I want to draw your attention to is the one that's Google Apps Resources. And when we click on the Google Apps Resources page, you will see that Eric and, along with me, have put together a wide variety of Google tutorials, Google Help resources, even a Google users group that you can join. So that's one of the items available on this page. The second item I want to draw your attention to is the one with the little uh, red eye on it, or the eye in the little red circle. This says technology links and information, the polite term for 
the web resource hoarder site. So this is the site that I maintain. And you notice it has a menu across the top, which will be going into different areas. And it also has a wide variety of resources. So that is the ti.apps.spark.org. And again, there's other things out here that you're going to be using. But I just want to point these out as part of, these are examples of semi-curated resources. So here's the Google Apps resources. I Even though we could go there live um, and drill down, I like to have some screenshots so we don't spend a lot of time having to get, wait for each page to load. And as many of you know, you always need a, a backup plan in case a site doesn't open. But the links are right here. You can pop into these things. And really, please, you know, as you're going through the slideshow, investigate all the links because my slides are not necessarily slideshows. They're more like little research documents. So I think of it as a, as a little booklet with a whole bunch of links in it. I always have a large number of links in my presentations. So here's the link to the website, the resource hoarder site. And you can put this up on your web page, please. Uh, I invite you to. And you can even tell people you you found this great resource. You can even tell them you created it if you want to. But there's also a nice quick link to it, tiny.cc slash WRH. So if you're walking by someone on the street and you say they ask you, can you recommend a good website? You can just say tiny.cc slash WRH for web resource hoarders. So one of the things that most teachers love are free items. So when you tell your staff of teachers in your building that, hey, by the way, in addition to all that stuff you have in your room already, I have a vast collection of free items I want to share with you. I'm going to provide that value to you in the form of a wide variety of free things. So I have created some links here for free items. Now, this started as a very small project. One of our neighboring districts, the tech coordinator, uh, called me and said they were dropping their paid commercial version of videos that their teachers use, their video library. And she asked me, Anthony, do you have a list of some sites that have free videos on them? Well, that was a mistake. Once she asked me that, I sort of went wild and extended it to a lot of areas. So I'll show you that in a moment here. Um, so let's go out to that resource. And again, you can click on it directly from the slideshow. You can also go out here to our web resource order site, and it says free books and more. And again, you can also go there from the link down here in the little buttons. So however you like to get there, we'll just choose the top menu item for right now. And you'll notice that it has a lot of free things listed. Now you may notice it took a few seconds for the middle of the page to load. And that's because it's not really a web page. It's a web page that wraps or embeds a Google spreadsheet. And you'll notice... The reason why you can tell it's a spreadsheet is little tabs would be the same sort of tabs you'd have at the bottom of a spreadsheet. So if we want to find ebooks, we click on the tab for books. If we're interested in news for kids, we would click on that tab. In each case, it will allow you to then have a list of items. So let's go to ebooks first. And just to give you an idea of how much is there, each of these sites has either all free materials or at least part of their materials are free. I do not have any sites that are commercial only here. So these are all sites where you can get free materials. These are eBooks. There's also educational videos. This was the original purpose of this site and the site quickly outgrew just that service. But you'll notice that there's a wide variety of online videos. Some things you may be familiar with like Khan Academy, but some things you may have never heard of before. Um, Library of Congress has a video, uh, set of videos. Uh, the Guru, which has a wide variety of lessons on Google Apps. Um, so there's some technical things, and there's also documentaries, there's history, there's science. There's a whole wide variety of videos available. Uh, some interactive content, which are sites that allow students to work with different materials. In some cases, they're only textbooks. Some sites are their simulations. We also have a news for kids. I know that this is something you might be interested in. You probably subscribe to some periodics, periodicals for your students. Um, and you can have some kid-based things, but you can't have everything. You can't have a lot. And the ones you do have may not circulate because... Uh, they need to be there for everyone when they visit the library. You might just cir circulate the older items. So 
it might be nice if a teacher wants to be able to do current events to be able to have news designed for students and in some cases by students and they can go there to these sites there's some that are some that are really really good that i'm going to point out to just let you know about and you'll notice that some are in yellow the ones in yellow are, are not there because they're really good sites they're there because they are not news sites they're information about the news uh, there's like quizzes there's how journalism works is one of the examples what's in a newspaper so there's a whole lot here um, some of you may have seen some of these like Dogo, Dogo News, which is a kid's site. We'll just pop that one open here in another tab. And you'll see that it is kid-related news articles. So this is a different a lot of variety of different formats, but the, the idea is that there are a wide variety of resources. And we're not even going to go into the rest of these, but just... Be aware that there are hundreds and hundreds of resources available, thousands actually here. So free stuff is always good. Well, if free stuff is always good, this is something I think is great, and that is to learn something new every day. That's one of my goals every day is to try and learn something new. Now, it might be something very small. Yesterday, I learned a new Google search trick that I never realized. You know, if you put in a set of digits, like 1575 and so forth, and then put in the equal sign, and then after that, type in English. And what it will do is it will convert that text string into a word string that would say, like, for example, 1,4332, and give it to you in text format as opposed to digit format. So that's something I learned new yesterday, and that's because I use some of the sites on the Learn Something New Everyday site. Now, there's a couple ways to get to it. We can click on the link right there, or we could go back to our website, and you'll see that there is a link for that right in the top, Learn Something New right here. And you can also go to the LSNED, which is also a link to the site. So there's a wide variety of ways to get to the Learn Something New Everyday site. Now, I have to warn you, the Learn Something New Everyday site is sometimes a little overwhelming when you first go in there. And also, I'm going to warn you of something else. The sites change over time. Sometimes the site may change direction. Sometimes it might go away. So I have to remove it, unfortunately. But... The good news is I'm always finding new sites. So we're currently at 215. That number jumps up and down, but I'm guessing by the end of the school year, I'll have over 250 there because I'm usually adding more than I'm removing. And I'm just going to go down here and give you a really, really quick tour. But on the left, you'll notice that we have some just general questions and information. Same thing in the middle column. But on the right, we're jumping right into some STEM and science. So you notice we have that over there on the set side. On the left, we jump into some how-tos. In the middle, we start getting into ref some reference materials and some more things such as question and quiz sites, which are pretty interesting. On the left, we get into some how-to videos, such as the Khan Academy, uh, a bunch of YouTube for education. On the right, we've jumped deeper into science, into physics and astronomy, and now we're going into simple machines, and we're moving into electronics. If we go back to our left again, you'll start to see a wide variety of GIN uh, sites that are how-tos, and then we get into references. In the middle, we've moved into some big ideas, such as TED Talks, but we also have that link to that free resources, and that's the same link we were just at on that page. On the left, we move into these resource, resource sites, plus searching sites, plus you can learn how to shave at the art of manliness. On the right, we've moved into some computer coding and then some computer hardware. In the middle, we start jumping into the arts, uh, I'm sorry, first we jump into the news, then we jump into the arts. On the left, we moved into history and geography. In the middle, we now jumped into uh, some drawing and other arts. And then we've jumped into Goodreads and literature in the middle. On the left, we started really moving back in history into archaeology and paleontology. And on the right, we've jumped into mechanics, woodworking, gardening, uh, uh, botany, etc. On the left, we've jumped into geography. In the middle, we start jumping into some on some more literature resources uh the free dictionary for example on the right we're starting to go into some more growing things around the house left more maps middle now we've moved into music uh with uh riff station and lyric find play with them they're uh, really fun sites um on the right we jumped into crafts we have a whole variety of craft items on the left we've moved into some 
things on time and also at atlas obscura please visit it if you haven't it's it's a real fun site because it has really strange geography locations and things in the middle you notice we moved into math on the left we're now we're going back through some videos and some uh on history and geography and on the right we've jumped into some games some google help in the middle we're talking about searching and some teacher resources and finally on the left we end with a little bit on cooking and recipes and things like that. So again, learn something new every day changes almost weekly, but try some of the sites, they're really interesting. And also some of the sites allow you to subscribe to them so that you'll get an email reminding you or giving you a tidbit for that site each day so you don't lose track of something that was very interesting. So again, this is something that you can share with your teachers. And I just did a little slide here, just a little screenshot. This is just some of the links that we just went down through. So you can give an idea and say, yeah, there's a few links there. So another area on, our, on the web resource hoarder site is the news section. I talked about the student news, but there's also other news sources available. Let's just jump back there real quick to the home page. And you will see that at the top we have news and media. And if we click on that link, you will notice that we have news for students, which you've already went through, but we also have education news. And that's news that the teachers might find helpful. It has things on education, uh, things that are going on in your local government with education, uh, public views of education, etc. And then we just have a news and media guide for resources, and that pops out. And this is a little bit localized in Northeast Ohio and the United States. So we have some networks of news outlets on the far left, which are pretty much national. In the middle, most of those yellow ones are going to be for local stations in our area, Northeast Ohio. But I also have newspapers around the world. So there's a whole variety of newspapers you can go to. Our local newspapers, but there are newspapers by country. Most of them have versions in English. And it's a great way to expose your students to news that's a little bit different slant because it's outside of the U.S. Uh, magazines and periodics, uh, some water services, and finding some weather and science to top that off. So that's the news section of our presentation here. Now, as much as teachers like free things for their classes, I think they really, really like free things for themselves. So I have a page called Teacher Resources, and on that page there's a whole variety of things. We're going to go take a quick tour of it. And again, we can just go across the top to where it says resources, teacher resources, or from our homepage, we can look for the link that simply says teach, uh, teacher resources on it with the little toolbox right here that shows us it's the teacher's toolbox of resources. And on there, on the left, I have a couple of really good presentations. First one takes them to some news, and then we have a whole presentation on what you need to stock a teacher's toolbox um, and we go beyond just the things, but we talk about professional learning, networking, and things like that. So this is a, um, a page that has a lot of those materials. On the left, most of these items on the left are blogs of leading educators or some pedagogy type of things. In the middle, we have a link to our webinars, which we always like to plug. And here's Eric's blog, Control, Delete, a whole bunch of stuff on Google. On the, on the right, we have some things on Edmodo. If you've never tried Edmodo before, it's great for a professional learning network. It's also something you can use with a classroom of students as sort of a learning uh, system for your students. This purple link here takes you back to the page I've already shown you. So I like to make sure that someone finds their way to these pages, even if they go to one specific one. So this takes us back to the free books. Oh, and Bartleby's.com, I'm sure all the librarians out there know about this, but if you don't, Click on this, follow that. It's great stuff, and it's great stuff to share with your language arts teachers. We'll just jump out there because it's so much fun. And you'll notice it's sort of like a online resources of a variety of things. You can go into anthologies, you can go into fiction, you can go into verse, you can go into sonnets, you can go through classical literature, and a lot of different things. And then they always run featured items on the left here, and in the middle, they usually have featured authors. So Bartaby.com, definitely want to share that with your with your students, I mean, with your teachers. And if you've never seen it before, you're going to want to go explore it. I think you'll love it. 
We jumped back a little bit too far. Let's get back to teacher resources again. On the right, we have some of our very recorded sources, but then we also have some links to world languages, a whole section on cultural and world languages, a whole section on maps and atlases. Um, video, online video. A lot of the teachers are not aware of the fact that almost all of the PBS Nature shows and many of the other PBS shows are available on demand as high definition videos from their websites. So the other night I was watching a great nature series and some I'm, I told someone about it, they said, oh, I wish I could watch that. So I was able to send them the link so they could just go watch the whole thing live. So these are great for using in the classroom. Um, right here, this little purple one with the bus with the wings on it, that's a session I just did recently. I did a webinar. Um, uh, I think that was my last webinar, actually, two weeks ago, on virtual field trips. So some things that you can share. And again, a lot of things on how-tos, on tools that you can use in the classroom. This section here on Eduelastic and, and Formative and EdSite are all sites where you can create very dynamic and very modern type of quizzes that are technology-rich, where you can slide things around, uh, check, move things, uh, et cetera. So they're not just like a quiz that's online but it's just questions these have a lot more things that you can do with them and then there's fun things like like kahoot that you can do as a game show in your classroom again some reference materials on the right here some more pedagogy for different areas of subjects here we have a few more um bloggers here educational resource people and then i have a site for example on mind mapping so when you go to the site you're going to see that it has a large listing of software programs, most of which are now online, but some of them do require installations. And many of them, many are not, actually most of them are free. There are some that cost money. And this is something you can share with your teachers if they want to do some mind mapping type things or just some charting things. There's a great set of resources right there available for them. Right below that, there's this whole section on timelines and chronology. And again, you notice these are embedded Google spreadsheets within a page so I can quickly add items when I find new resources for each of these. Makes my curation a little bit easier. We jumped out of our site. We'll jump back in here again and wait for it to reload. We'll get down to the bottom. you notice we have a lot more educational things. We have a couple search engines thrown in here, a couple math sites, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of things here. Uh, and please, by any means, if it's at the bottom, that doesn't mean it's not great. That just means I probably just added it more recently because I don't always go back and resort through all these. So Common Sense Graphite, I can really, really strongly recommend that. Many of you are probably using that as part of your Internet safety um, program in your school. So check that out if you've never been there before. I think you'll find it useful. Okay, so let's go back to our slideshow. I've put together a section on 21st century literacies, and I sort of divided it into 12 different literacies. Um, I could have did 10, I could have did 9, but I just sort of chose 12 because it was sort of a nice number to use. And you can find these on the Web Resource Hoarder site by simply going where it says 12 literacies, and you notice that each one, then can, you can click on it. So let's go to language and textual first. This site has a lot of things for language arts teachers. And this is an example of a site that's mediumly built. I mean, in other words, I've not really completed this site. I'm still adding a lot of things to it. Uh, matter of fact, just, just two days ago, I added a whole thing on for St. Patrick's Day on Walking Ulysses, the James Joyce by, uh, story, the, the endless story without any punctuation that people always think about reading, but it's so long that many times they don't read it. But what you can do, this is an interactive virtual tour of Dublin both in Joyce's time and in modern time. So a good way to tie literature in with other content areas. Uh, Weasel Words and Puffery is a great thing for uh, grammar and for writing. The Purdue Lab, of course, you probably all know about that already, but a great resource for writing materials, for, especially for high school students who are going to be doing research projects. And then Eric and I, we sort of get hung up on some things that are fun, and we sort of like entomology. So I have a couple entomology sites right here that are really fun to play around with. Small Adventures in Language, I think you'll find that just, that's the problem with me. I find these great sites, and it can just 
pull me in for hours at a time. Now at the bottom you notice I have some old fashioned links. These are things I've pulled in from my old site. I have not got a chance to update these with nice little buttons yet, but I will be doing that. But you notice at the bottom, this whole section is on radio and TV. Everything from the history of TV to finding TV stations, radio stations, um, to TV scripts. If you want to find out what happened on a TV show, uh, here's a whole section where you can go back and look through old television shows and find out about the scripts. Creative writing, uh, you can even have a whole class just based on that in um, film and TV. So this again are the 12 different literacies. I'm gonna pop to one other, one other one here real quick. I won't go through them all, I promise. And that's the historical site. And what happened is it originally started as a history site separate from a geography site where well, they actually sort of got on the same page and um, so you notice that on the far right it's almost all geography on the in the middle it's mostly history on the left we have pedagogy and teaching social studies and then on the left we also have some news items and you notice that some of these will repeat because I want to make sure I catch people no matter which page they go to so a lot of geography on the right um, history in the middle and then on the left, we have a variety of things. We have some more pedagogy, some more teaching, different things. Um, some great sites here for civics, um, some more geography, even going into things such as genetic mapping. Um, I have three whole sections here on that are involved in genetic mapping uh, around the world, finding out where people live, this you how you alls and use talk. Uh, section for the New York Times. If you've never taken that quiz before, it's great. You take a little quiz and it shows you hot spots on the map of the United States, guessing where you learned your or acquired your language skills. Um, mine came within just a few miles of where I lived. I mean, it was fantastic. It narrowed right on it. My wife, unfortunately, speaks much better than I do, and she's a school teacher, and she's pretty much removed all the colloquialisms and locality out of her language, and hers was just a nice, mellow color covering most of the United States. They couldn't pinpoint her. So this is social studies site. Show your social studies teachers. I think they'll find this very interesting. And even at the bottom, we have a wide variety of social studies games. I love to play the get GeoGuessr just drops you in the world somewhere on a Google street view and you have to figure out where you're at, but it'd be too easy if the signs were there, so they blank out the signs so you can't figure that out. And you gotta guess. The best I ever came was 40 kilometers. That's, I've been whole continents way before, but one time I was able to get within 40 kilometers, so that was really exciting out of the whole world. Whole section here on, on some teaching techniques uh, for social studies, but they also apply to a lot of other areas. So you may wanna take a look at that. So those are the 12 literacies, and as I said before, they're there for everyone. Esotectric is a uh, site that I put together for people that are esoteric and want technology. In other words, this is a geeky, geeky site, and so this is only for those who like to really get into geeky things. So you notice a little picture here. Some of you may be geeks out there, and you might recognize the old DOS prompt, and again, that's out there. If nothing else, share this with your tech person in your district. They'll love you for it because it has a lot of great resources for technology. Right, we'll just go here this way. Here's our site, and you notice it has it's not it's platform and hardware and software agnostic. It has a whole variety of things. Again, if technology makes your brain hurt, you don't want to go here. And of course, our recorded webinars, which you're taking part in right now, is now, I think we're at 35 recorded webinars. Please feel free to share these with your teachers. It's a great way there for them to get 35 possible um, professional development hours. And they can do it over spring break. Just binge watch this. You don't need Netflix. You don't need who You don't need Amazon when, when you can just watch webinars. Okay, so that was my semi-curated collection. Now we're gonna talk about what you need to do to share your stuff, and as I see the time, we're gonna run over today. So fortunately, YouTube doesn't charge us any long anymore for making the hangout a little bit longer. And that's a great segue into the fact that YouTube for libraries, finding and managing and sharing tons of resources that you find. There are so many good videos out there 
on YouTube, and there's so many really, really bad videos out there on YouTube. So what you can do is you can help to be the person in your school that advises people on videos, just like you do on books. And there's something really neat on YouTube that you may or may not be aware of. The first thing is you need to be logged in through your Google Apps account or your Chrome account so you can get to the special places on YouTube. And what I mean by the special places on YouTube, by having a Google account, you can set up a channel. And it's not by default, but you can just go in there very easily and say, I want to create a YouTube channel. Once you create a YouTube channel, that's your channel where you can put things. So that's where our webinars go. They go into our YouTube channel uh, via Hangouts. And they automatically get put there as we record each Hangout. So it's very easy to create content for your channel. But without your channel, yeah, you, you can't really put stuff there. You can only watch things that other people put there. Now, fortunately, there's something called playlists. And even if you don't want to create content or have your own channel, you can create playlists. And playlists are collections of videos. So this is where you might go out and say, you know, the kids are going to be studying um, momentum in science. So let me go out and find some sites that, that show some things about momentum and show some different aspects of it. And I can put together a really good collection of videos. Well, you you make it a playlist. You then share that playlist with the teacher that's responsible for that. And the nice thing about playlist is you can make as many playlists as you want. Playlists can be shared with other people, or you can make them private. So you can set the category, you can set the sharing level of playlist. You can only have one channel, but you can have multiple playlists out there. So playlists are a great way to create individual listings of YouTubes for your teachers. Now, you could give them the links to them, but that's sort of boring. It's really nice if they can go to one place, one playlist that you control for each of these different areas. And this little slot, this slide here gives you an idea of how you set up a playlist. I'm not going to go into the details because we're not going to have time today, but there's a whole section here on creating YouTube playlist. And there is a link here to a YouTube presentation that Eric put together on using YouTube to promote your library. So that brings us to the point of promoting a library. We have all these great things going on. So now we need to get the word out so other people know about what's going on in our library, and it's not just the library. So there's a lot of different ways to do those. We can do web pages. We can do blogs. We can use social media. We can use webinars. We can just be passing out the information because we, you've got the right stuff now. Now you need to hook them. Well, how do you hook them? Well, there's something very interesting about students. And this is, this, I'm sure, the same in your school because it's the same everywhere in the world. If a teacher says the word pi, you might have an idea of what each of these kids are thinking, but here's what they're actually thinking. And you notice we have eight students here, and all of them are thinking about something different when the teacher said pi. Well, why are they thinking about something different? Because they have different learning styles. They have different ways of approaching problems. You'll notice that one person, of course, has the mathematical symbol pi, where someone else has the ingredients to make a pi. And another person has a pie chart on a spreadsheet. So students learn in different ways. So if students learn in different ways and we want to be most successful, you might want to occasionally teach them differently. Well, this is where you can come in as a librarian because you can provide additional resources to the teacher in a wide variety of formats and focuses so that they can be providing students information in a format that they will best learn with. So they need content for a variety of learning styles. You can provide content because you know how to curate and find things and share things with your staff. And once you do that for one teacher, you're going to have another teacher saying, hey, can you do that for me? So all you need to do is hook a few teachers, and they will come to you. That's the great part about it. Matter of fact, they may come to you so much that you may start to think, well, maybe I shouldn't have told as many people about this. But no, you want that because you want your library always to be in demand. I know you do. So you have all your curator resources, whether they're web pages list, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get them out there to them? We talked about YouTube real quick, but there's other ways to do it. And I sort of got ahead of myself here, but there's other 
content material. And I'm going to set the skip over this for time purposes. Again, you can go back and go through this. And also, you can create your own videos, your own webinars, such as this hangout I'm doing today. But you can also create your own video, video, video virtual field trips and share those with your staff. Here's a whole thing on how to guides on creating content, how to do screenshots, um, how to share things as Google Docs, um, make how to list. So these can be used with both teachers and students. So you're, you're creating content and great instructional materials. So not just content, but instructional materials. So now we need to get a presence. We need to get out there in front of people so they know, again, all these great resources you have for them. So let's go in and look at a couple of these ways you can share information. One way is you could have a library website, or maybe you, you're more of a blogger. And a website and a blog, they're very similar. We'll talk about the difference in a few moments here. You can also use collection sharing. I know a lot of you are already on Pinterest. Um, some people like Symbaloo. This is a great place where you can put a link to a site, and it's graphical. It's easy to put there. It's, it's a very visually appealing. It doesn't take long for you to get the resources there. So you can put together a Symbaloo for teachers so that they can go into resources. And you can create multiple Symbaloos for different areas of curriculum or different grade levels. You can also do things like social bookmarking, sort of falling out of favor, not as common anymore as these visual type of collections. You might want to have a library newsletter, not just a printed library newsletter. You can have an online newsletter. You can have a newsletter that has interviews. You can have a newsletter that has recordings of students reading previews to books. You might want to use social media. We'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. And again, your YouTube channels and playlists are great ways to promote your library. So what's the difference between a website and a blog? Well, they sort of cross over each other. Let's talk a little bit about some of the ways you can get to these points. Maybe your district already has a district website and with that they might have building websites and maybe they might have teacher websites so hopefully maybe you can just jump into a site that's already there for you and set up for your library if not there's other ways to go about doing that um, you can set up a separate website now I usually tend to suggest people avoid creating a private site when they can do it as part of their district for a couple reasons one I think it's m much better for teachers parents, students, et cetera, to be seeing your materials within the context of your professional location, your library, your school, as opposed to your personal environment. So you may want, you might want a personal website, but I would not cross the two over. Now, your website might have some horrendously long names such as techweb.resources.spark.org. Well, that's where I use that little URL shortener, so I made it tiny.c slash wrh. And tiny.cc tiny is free. Go to tiny.cc. You can create your own account. You can create shortcuts to any really long website. And you can also create QR codes. Well, what are QR codes? Well, you saw way back in the beginning of the session, there was a little QR code that you can shoot with your, your phone or your camera. And when you do that, it'll actually open the page directly in that phone or your tablet. So it's a great way that you can have a sign outside your library and, you know, book of the day, book of the week, book of the month. That can bring them right to that page just by shooting it with their camera. So uh, let's talk about web presence. You can build pages. There's a lot of different ways to do this. You can write HTML code from a text process, word process if you want to. You're probably not going to want to go that route. There's so many good building tools out there. There's some free and inexpensive sites out there such as Google Sites, Weebly, Wix. These are all sites that have building tools built into them, and they are free. We use Google Sites here quite a bit at Spark because it integrates, integrates very well with the Google Apps for Education that we use with a lot of, a lot of our districts. It's also all web-based. So in other words, I can edit it anytime, anywhere from anyone's device. I don't need to be logged in. I mean, I need to log in, but I don't need to be on my own computer. And it's a what you see is what you get, a WYSIWYG building tool. In other words, I can see the stuff as I'm building it. So you can insert docs, you can insert spreadsheets, you can insert calendars, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why do I insert spreadsheets? Well, first of all, I love spreadsheets, but that's not the reason. If I put the content in a spreadsheet, I can sort it 
filter it and do things with it that I can't do on a web page easily. So if I have a whole list of sites and I want to go to a website, if I'm using a website builder, I can't hit a magic button that says, hey, sort this in order by the second column. I can't sort it in any way. So that's why I like having things in a spreadsheet. The other thing is when I'm working in my spreadsheet, I don't need to be in the web page. So if it's in the spreadsheet is embedded in the web page already, you can share the edit rights of that spreadsheet with other people and they can help you and they can put things in without having to worry about getting into the website. They don't need the password. They don't need to know how to build the site. They can simply pop things in, in and out of that spreadsheet and it'll automatically show up on the website. Same thing with a Google a slideshow that's embedded. You can do the same sort of thing with that. So when you create a Google site, you can make the whole site or individual pages public or private. So if you have things that you want to share only with certain people, you can make that a private or you can share it with just a select group of teachers. So maybe you have some resources that are, you want to share directly with the teachers, but you don't want to share directly with the students. Well, you can make those pages private to those teachers. Some other here's some resources on building Google Sites. Eric just did his third webinar on Google Sites. So this Google, Google Sites one, two, and three. Sit down for three hours and learn almost everything you need to know about Google Sites. Okay, what are blogs? Blogs are a type of website, and they can contain the same sort of material. But usually, the thing that sets blogs aside is the fact that they use are a sequential series of posts. And uh, for example, on Eric's Control Alt Delete site, I'm sorry, Control Alt Achieve site, he's going to be mad when I said that. Um, he does almost daily posts on educational technology. The other thing blogs lend themselves to, it's very easy for people to share information they find on a blog via social media. They can retweet it, they can send it out through a wide variety of things. So it's a great way to have the word spread besides just the people that find your blog. Again, here's some of our, our what I call symbolic or visual sharing tools, Symbolu, Pinterest, etc. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons of some of these. Some of the pros is they're very easy to use. Some of the cons is, are that you are limited in the types of resources. Maybe you can't embed a spreadsheet. Maybe you can't embed a video in it. Some of them, such as Pinterest, the many of the traditional uh, social bookmarking sites require an account. So if it requires an account, that means that everyone's not going to see it. So you limit your audience for your presence on the web. Also, some of the sites require users to be 13 years of older. So if you teach in an elementary school and you put all your materials up on a site like that, it doesn't do the students a lot of good. And some of these are not very easy to integrate with district and building sites. They may require a separate, they may look different, they may require login, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things that are pros and cons. A couple more here. Um, and I don't know where it's at. I'll just mention it here. One of the, one of the, it's, it's coming up side, so we'll wait until we get there. Okay. So you can also use social media such as Google Communities, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Now, your school may, may block some of these, and that's what I want to talk about now, some of the pros and cons of social media. First of all, the general public knows what it is. If you talk about a symbol, most people aren't going to know what a symbol is, but if you talk about Facebook, most people are going to know what Facebook is. So, again, familiar to the public, a great way to get out of information. It's easy to share the content of social media. One thing you can do is you can, it can be reshared by others. And that's great because that broadens your reach. So you share it with some people and then they can reshare it. Now, some of the cons are, as I said earlier, they may be blocked by school filters. Maybe your school doesn't allow certain social media or all social media. So again, that would be hampering your ability to publicize your library within. They may have age restrictions, which you already mentioned. The content format might, might be limited. And another con, um, Sometimes the other materials on these social media sites are not age appropriate to go along with your age appropriate material. So you need to be aware of that when you're working with social media. Um, Eric did a whole thing on Google Communities. We have a webinar on that. You can watch the webinar. And here's some more information on Google user groups, Google Plus communities. Um, there's a Twitter chat that takes place for librarians every Tuesday night at about 8 p.m. 
to 9 30 p.m that's eastern standard time so if you're in thailand that means seven uh let's see I'm, i think it's seven in the morning or something some some other time but you have to figure out from eastern standard time when this occurs and you use this hashtag and it's just a chat with people that are interested in libraries so that's a great way to again spread information and get information okay we talked about newsletters and newsletters as an electronic way are a great way to get information out and the the advantage of electronic is it's it doesn't cost very much it can be totally free in most cases you don't have to worry about the paper running out using up all the copier time etc cetera, etc cetera. you know being able to put things in color being able to put things in that move you can't do that on paper at least not very well my son tried for years to make all of his art projects three-dimensional no matter what it was so now he does computer software so he can design robotics and do everything for him in a fashion that is three-dimensional so and there's social media jumping in with a phone call there okay well, we killed that fortunately so a great option is mailchimp mailchimp is a, is a commercial product but up until twelve thousand, uh, up until a certain amount of users two thousand users or subscribers per month it's free so we utilize it for our google i'm sorry for our spark newsletter which you can get to from our spark technology integration page and that brings up spark lines which is our newsletter and here's the link directly to it please sign up for that that'll give you updates on upcoming webinars such as today and a wide variety of other uh, events that we're working with we also like to spotlight technology um, learning opportunities within the state of ohio and within the region so that people can um, be up to up on those items even though that we're not doing them specifically some of the things you might want to consider creating would be videos again we talked about youtube and we talked about the ability for you to um, use youtube to get information on the library you can also use it to build build content that is book related that is literacy related you can showcase student work now when you do showcase student work no matter what medium it is whether it's a video whether it's a newsletter whatever it is you need to make sure that you're doing it in such a fashion that your students will be uh, will not you will not violate your student privacy policies so make sure you have media releases make sure that you don't do things that your school doesn't allow, to do, allow you to do so make sure you take a look at the the rules for that type of thing in your school but the nice night thing nice thing is when you create student work and you utilize when you create student work and utilize it for your session um, your students will perform at a much higher level because they know other people are out there wanting to view this so they they want it to be a little bit better than just what they might do in class and i'm sorry about my phone ringing here um so again you want content we have content so please feel free to link to our either of these here's some little buttons if you want to use them there's a whole another section on our web page there here's other links to the site here's how you can create your own little buttons if you're interested in but creating buttons and again, all the resources for today's webinar can be found at tiny.cc slash spark 2036, I'm sorry, 236. Again, also feel free to contact Eric or myself. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear feedback on the, on the webinars. We also have ideas on future webinars. So tell us what you're doing with your webinars. We'd be glad to, to hear that and very excited to hear that. And, uh, that pretty much brings us to the end of today's session. Just want to remind you again, go to the webpage. Here's our calendar of upcoming events. Subscribe to the Sparklines newsletter. While you're there, you can also then go to the session that we did today and take the quiz. And if you pass the quiz, you will get a certificate emailed to you as a PDF almost immediately, maybe within a minute or so, of one contact hour through the Stark County ESC. And then also, please give us some feedback through the evaluation tool. So again, thank you very much for uh, going a little over time here and I apologize for the phones ringing and all the interruptions, but I think we're going to uh, call it a day here. I think I probably went a little bit over time, but I'd like to thank you all for attending today and please watch for our upcoming webinars.